This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. Today, we had a great guest. All of our guests are great. I think I've said that before. But we had Rick Ferry. Anyone who follows or is interested in index investing will probably have read something of Rick's. He's written seven books, working on the eighth. But he's written a ton online as well. And he's been, he used to be, I don't know if he still is, extremely active in the Bogleheads online forum. He's an absolute leader in the space. To have gone to Jamie Dimon, who was the head of Smith Barney in the mid 70s and proposed a low fee asset allocation portfolio using ETFs and was turned down or resoundingly turned down. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, it is. And I mean, Rick's impressive, right? Like he was in the Marines before coming into financial services. And then, like you said, Cameron, he really spearheaded this movement and he opened, I don't know if it was the first, but was it the first portfolio solutions, the first kind of low fee index fund based wealth management shop? I believe so. Built it up to over a billion dollar company. But he kind of created that model of of fiduciary advice, low cost, using index funds, putting the client first. And he's certainly one of the earliest, most vocal supporters of this approach. And as he told us, you have to keep telling the truth time and time and time again to get the message through. And now he doesn't have to work, as he says, but he's on a journey to tell people about this. And he's so passionate about it. I think that comes out through the conversation, but he's just so passionate about this stuff. And when we talked for another 30 minutes after we stopped the recording, I think he could have gone on all day, which I was happy to listen to. Yeah, terrific guy. Very gracious of him. Talks about his relationship with John Bogle, who recently passed away. That was a pretty meaningful conversation. Yeah. Anyway, it was a great conversation, so we hope you enjoy it. So, Rick, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. No, thank you for having me today. I've been looking forward to this for years. I've followed you for years. I've seen you at a, a dimensional conference in the past. And I think it's safe for us to say that you're one of the founding fathers of bringing low-cost index investing mainstream. And I'm really curious, what made you so passionate about spreading this message? Well, you know, when I first started in the industry, I had come out of the Marine Corps. I had done eight years in the Marine Corps. And truth and integrity are everything in the Marine Corps. Uh, Your life depends on it. And I was always very precise about providing accurate information, I mean, to my troops. I was a pilot. I used to fly jets on aircraft carriers, and that's all very precise. It has to be very accurate. The people who are working on your aircraft have to be accurate and precise and truthful, especially the people who are working on the ejection seat. That was very critical. So when I got into the investment industry, I found a world that was completely opposite of that. There was very little truth that I found, a lot of misconceptions, a lot of a misrepresentation, and it, it bothered me greatly right from the beginning. And so I decided I needed to know more. I went out and achieved my uh, CFA. I received a Chartered Financial Analyst Charter from the CFA Institute. I went and I started a master's program in finance where I studied mainly economics and statistics. Anyway, I was looking for truth in the investment industry, and there wasn't any. I, w- I was very difficult to find it. I had tried to pick investments, I had tried to pick money managers, I had tried to many different things. Uh, And finally, uh, after reading every book I could possibly read, I picked up a book in 1996 called Bogle on Mutual Funds. And this is where I was enlightened. What John Bogle was saying in his book, his first book, which he had wrote about two years earlier, was that it is very difficult to find people who are going to outperform and don't even bother. Just buy the market and you'll be better off. And it was uh, an epiphany. I mean, a light went on. I said, he's right. And I found there was other people like me out there and that this was the path I was going to go on. If I was going to stay in the financial services industry, this was the path I was going to go on and what I believed in. And that's how I got started. It's really interesting, Rick. And index investing in general has come a a really long way since you started in the business many years ago. You tweeted something late last year that kind of speaks to where index investors are now. And I want to ask you about that. So your tweet was, the education of an index investor, born in darkness, finds indexing enlightenment, overcomplicates everything, embraces simplicity. So I thought that was a great tweet. But what I want to ask you is how much value do you think investors should place on simplicity versus indexing tweaks like adding small caps or trying to optimize asset location. So you are asking 
a whole bunch of questions all together. And it, could I take a moment and talk about the four levels of an indexer goes through, and a successful indexer goes through to get to the last level? Okay. By the way, I'm writing a book called The Education of an Index Investor, and is exactly what you talked about, the four levels that an investor goes through. They start out in darkness. It doesn't necessarily mean they don't know anything about investing. They just are not measuring their performance and, and not capturing the fact that it's difficult to outperform and hadn't hit that enlightenment stage that I talked about a while back in my last answer. Well, at some point, if you are in this long enough and you measure your performance long enough and you're honest with yourself and you're honest with your ability and you're also honest with what you can possibly know out there, you eventually come to the realization that indexing, although it may not be perfect, is a much better strategy than anything else that you could do for yourself. So that's the first stage, which is enlightenment. So you go from darkness to enlightenment. But once you become enlightened, a lot of people start to absorb knowledge. They crave uh, knowledge, crave books, crave learning everything that they can about indexing and indexes and uh, asset allocation and optimization and trying to create what I call the perfect portfolio. And this leads to complexity. You overcomplicate everything. And part of that, by the way, you touched on is the idea of factor investing, which is to add small cap and value and such, which is not bad, but it is. it adds a lot of complexity to a portfolio. People have difficulty figuring out how much should they have, which one should they have, how do you measure value, where do you cut off small cap, should you use micro cap, what about international? And you start slicing and dicing and overcomplicating things in your portfolio to the point where you can get to paralysis by analysis, which is you've caught, sort of regressed back to active management a little bit and regress back into darkness a little bit because you're really not capturing the essence of the enlightenment that you originally had. And when you hit that point and you realize that you're doing this, you realize that a lot of the stuff that you're worrying about and trying to find the perfect portfolio really doesn't matter in the long run. I mean, what really matters is your stock and bond mix. And as you said, controlling costs, controlling taxes, you go to a more simpler portfolio, uh, fewer asset classes, fewer funds, maybe fewer accounts if you can consolidate IRAs and such. And you don't worry about factor investing anymore. You might have it. It might enhance your portfolio, but it isn't uh, the cake. And that, that's all that you realize is just the icing on the cake. It's like a wedding cake, a white wedding cake. I mean, the outside all looks different and it's all beautiful to all different people. But in fact, when you cut the cake, it's still the same cake inside. And when you realize that, you go back to simplicity and now you've reached the final stage of the education of an index investor. Darkness, enlightenment, complexity, and simplicity. And I'm right now all about simplicity. I'm all about keeping things simple. And I realize I'm also perhaps a little older than you. I'm in my 60s now. So to me, downsizing and simplifying are a big deal for me and a big deal for baby boomers in general. And so part of that is making your portfolio less complicated, not giving up anything, just making it less complicated, not only for yourself, but also for those who might inherit this portfolio later on. If you only have four or five funds in there, it just makes it so much easier than complicating it up with 12, 13, 15, 20 funds on, in a slice and dice portfolio. So that's what it's all about. What a terrific answer. So, and to follow on to that, in the past year, Canada has had a number of what we call one decision portfolios come out from iShares and Vanguard. Are you a fan of one decision solutions like that as opposed to the three or four or five ETF solutions? Yeah. I mean, the one decision solutions are very simply, from what I understand, just a fund of funds where within the fund or within the exchange traded fund, there are other funds. So it becomes a fund of funds. It's a balanced portfolio where you don't have to uh, rebalance your uh, stocks and bonds when things get out of whack. Now, Vanguard has had this for many years, and I know iShares now is getting on board. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I mean, we've seen a real benefit in the 401k and the retirement market here in the States with target date retirement funds. And I think that more people are going to gravitate more towards these fund of funds where everything is done for you because it keeps you disciplined. The data shows that People stay in those funds as opposed to jumping out when markets go down 
or trying to change their asset allocation, they tend to put the money in and stay there. And that's what you need to do in the long term. So I am a fan as long as the fees are low. Rick, you mentioned you mentioned factors when we were talking about simplicity. And I believe that with portfolio solutions, when you were there, you guys were using dimensional. Is that correct? Correct. We were using a couple of dimensional funds. Okay. And I know you've been critical of terms like evidence-based investing and smart beta. So I, I just wanted to ask, how would you describe dimensional funds? Well, dimensional funds is uh, active management that uses factor-based investing principles. So they're looking for systematic risks within the markets to try to isolate risks that cannot be diversified away. And it might be small cap, it might be value, momentum, quality. And so it's a multi-factor type approach to adding risks in your portfolio in addition to market risks. So these are additional risks that you're adding into your portfolio in addition to market risk to try to enhance the return of the portfolio, although you are adding more risk to the portfolio. Now, there is an argument that, well, these factors are not 100% correlated, and therefore you're going to get a benefit from diversifying the different risk factors. And that might be true, but I don't really count that personally. I just look at it as, I'll take a little bit more risk. It might be a little bit different than just market risk that might enhance the portfolio return in the long term. And I don't go overboard on the whole thing. That's a great answer. And I've got a little bit of a follow-up question. One of the things that Cameron and I talked about in the podcast a while ago was funds from companies like AQR, which are kind of, they're doing a lot to create additional independent risk factors. Now, we think that's a little bit extreme for our our clients' portfolios. What are your thoughts on, I guess, non-market risk factors fitting into a portfolio? Yeah. So, of course, one of the problems, the way you do it, if you're doing it either just long only or you're doing it long short. And to do it long only means you're going to have a lot of beta. 80% of your portfolio is going to be beta, maybe 85. And then there's going to be a little bit of the uh, other risk factor in there. So the way to capture just the risk factor or try to capture as much of that as you can without beta is to go long short. A couple of problems with the long short is that it takes up space in a portfolio that otherwise would have been allocated to beta. So this is a real true allocation to the other risk factor. Uh, Secondly, that can be quite expensive to do it that way, not only from a trading standpoint, but also from a fee standpoint. Now, there is a cash component to that. And if interest rates are low, you get a lower rate of return. If interest rates are higher with the cash component of it, you get a higher rate of return. I don't want to go into the technical side of it, but it's a way of of doing it. I think that more for institutional investors than individual investors, you really would need a very sophisticated individual investor to employ that kind of a, a fund in there. Not out of the question. It's just if this is what you believe in, and you want to have these exposures in your portfolio, how do you do it? Do you do it long only where you get a lot of beta? Or do you do it through long short where you get only the other risk factors you're seeking, but potentially at a higher cost? I know that was a technical answer, but I hope I answered your question. That's a perfect answer. Thank you. So I have a separate question for you. You were on Barry Ridholtz's as Masters in Business podcast a few years ago. And Barry asked you how much of your time you spend on behavioral coaching. And I believe your answer was 95% of your time is being a behavior coach. Now, you're a pioneer in in low cost, providing low cost advice. What are your thoughts on the price and the value around behavioral coaching? Well, I think that's pretty much what an advisor does. Uh, Like I said, 95% because the portfolios are out there. The technical side of this is out there. You know, you can divide what we do in the industry between technical and behavioral. Uh, so the technical stuff is everywhere. You know, you can go anywhere and, and get an uh, asset allocation uh, pie chart. One, one of my friends was telling me, oh, I talked with this advisor and that advisor last week. He's not a client. He said, and everybody has their pie. Everybody is selling pie. So they're all selling pie charts, you know, asset allocation models. And I thought that was funny. So it's all out there. It's pretty much free, as you were talking about these balanced portfolios now are becoming popular. That, that stuff's free. But what isn't free is a psychologist to help you get through the rough times, uh, a behavioral coach who can help you stay the course, as John Bogle would say. And that, I believe, is one of the main reasons why people hire an advisor to help them stay the course. One of my former clients was a very bright man who got through 
uh, one of the major law schools by the time he was 20 years old. So he had graduated from high school, graduated from college, and finished law school when he was 20 years old. He hired me because he could not stay the course. He could not maintain his portfolio. He knew what to do. He knew he needed index funds. He knew he needed a fixed allocation to index funds. He got it. He saw it. He just couldn't do it. So he hired me to have conversations with him and keep him on track. And so I believe this is what the role of most financial advisors is. Once you get past the technical stuff, once you get the accounts set up, once you get to help them with determining whether you should have a trust or you should not have a trust and things like that and do the financial plan. After that, it's 95% behavioral coaching. It's a great answer, Rick. Now, you've left the firm that you're with, Portfolio Solutions, the firm that you built, and you've started a new venture called Core 4 Portfolios. So you've built a website that has, like you said, the the, the portfolios are out there for free and, and you're, you've now done that explicitly where you've put the portfolios online for free, which is great. The other thing that you're offering through the the site, as far as I can tell, is hourly advice so that someone can call Rick and get advice from, from you. The question that I have for you is, we were just talking about behavioral coaching. There are some technical aspects to investing as well. What do you expect when, when people start calling you? What do you expect they're going to be calling to ask you about? Well, it, it is when they start calling me because my non-compete doesn't end until the middle of April. So I, I, uh, I set up everything of which I legally can do. I set up my website. I set up what I'm going to be doing. I am file, uh, filing my ADV in the next few weeks uh, down here to uh, you know to become a, a registered investment advisor. So I'm not one now, and I'm not, I don't have any clients. But the website, as you said, does have some model portfolios in it. So I think that uh, a lot of people are going to be looking for second opinions. In fact, I coined this term called uh, portfolio second opinion, even though everybody uses that phrase. I'm going to be using it on my uh, offering, which is simply call me, pay me a fixed fee uh, to look at your portfolio, give you my recommendations on what you could do to make it better, send you on your way. And if you need more help, call me back. Simple as that. I think there's a huge need out there for that. There are people that are doing this, but I'm not saying you shouldn't use an advisor. If you want to implement your portfolio with an advisor, you can use your current advisor, just go to them and say, hey, here's the portfolio I want to implement and work with them on it. I also expect to get business from advisors. Um, a lot of financial planners really don't enjoy the investment portion of what they do and would rather have some expert, if you will. And I hate using, calling myself an expert because nobody is an expert, but somebody else help the client with the asset allocation and come up with the proper portfolio. And then the financial planner helped the client implement it. So it's not just directly from investors. I expect half of my business to come from advisors and financial planners. And I guess it would almost be a natural fit too to the whole robo-advisor landscape as well. And I'm curious, so how might you fit in with that? And what do you see about the, for the future of robo-advisors? That's a good question. Yeah. How, how does my ideas fit in with robo-advisors? It, it fits in very well. Now, what I hope to do once I launch is to work with certain robo-advisors to create these simple core four type portfolios, which would be on their platform. And then if investors choose not to do it themselves by buying the funds themselves, they could go to one of these platforms and it would be there and they could use uh, a core four portfolio, which is already up on one of those platforms. So I think it's good. It gets back to discipline. Uh, there are three things, and I'm going to get off on another topic here, but we can talk about it. So I'll just mention it briefly now. There are three things required for a person to be a good index investor in the long term. There's the philosophy. You have to believe in low fee, believe in indexing, believe that this is in the best interest, in your best interest. So you have the philosophy. Then there's strategy. How are you going to use that philosophy for yourself in your own unique situation? Yours is different than mine. It's different from the next person's. So while philosophy is universal, strategy is personal. So you have your personal strategy for your need. But the third part of that is discipline. How do you maintain it? How do you maintain the strategy? How do you maintain the philosophy? And automation, automating as much as you can automating investing, automating rebalancing, automating tax management, automating as much as you can through a balanced fund or probably uh, through a robo-advisor or maybe by hiring an advisor is the way to go. 
every study has shown that if you can give it to somebody else to do it and you forget about it and it's automated, you have a much higher probability of maintaining it. So that's where the uh, robo-advisors and the advisors and the balanced fund ideas come in. I love that philosophy, strategy, discipline. I think that's that's great. Now, kind of on that topic, there are still a ton of people. I mean, we're talking about indexing like everybody's doing it. We're taking that for granted. But the reality is the majority of invest of assets anyway are still actively managed, at least in Canada. I believe it's still the same in the US as well. For those people who have not started indexing yet, what do you think it takes? Repetition. I think uh, you need to see something about 100 times and on the 104th time, first time you have enlightenment. So people can look at the word index funds, they can read about it, they can listen to this podcast. That might be a little bit overboard listening to this podcast, but because uh, people who are only really interested in it are, are going to probably listen. So, But they've got to be exposed to it. They've got to see it. They've got to hear it. They've got to, somebody has to say it on, on television. They have to read about it on the internet. It's about a hundred times they need to be exposed to the word indexing outperforms active management before they actually actually take a look at it to the point where they they become enlightened. So you need just need more repetition. The difference between Canada and the US is we've had indexing here in the United States for a long time and it has been promoted by Vanguard, a mutual benefit company. Up in Canada, you didn't have a Vanguard. You do now, but you didn't at the time. So you had no mutual benefit company promoting the idea. You had for-profit companies promoting active management, and you only had a few advisors promoting indexing. And even then, that was relatively recent. So you're, you're, you just need more, uh, more in the media, more podcasts, more books, more articles, just more, 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 more saying the same thing over and over and over again, only a little bit differently. Uh, I remember having a conversation with uh, Jonathan Clements, who was a journalist down here, and we agreed that nothing new has happened in this industry in 25 years, but we continually figure out new ways of saying something to make it sound new. And that's what you just got to be repetitive, 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 and they will come. Well, we are doing our part, Rick, so let's hope we're making a difference. I have a separate question for you. So let's assume you've got way more money than you'll ever need, and that person comes to you to figure out what their asset allocation should be. I mean, we all know Larry Suedro, his rule of thumb is you take on the amount of risk that you're able, willing, and need to take on. How do you coach someone that has far more assets than they will ever need in terms of their equity exposure? Right. So the first thing I do is say, how much do you need and how much are you going to pass on to the next generation? And by you, I mean you and your spouse and how much you're going to go to your children or your grandchildren are going to go to charity or wherever it's going to go later on. What do you need for you until you live to say 100 or your spouse lives to 100? And then what are you giving to the next generation? And they go, well, okay, I need a million dollars for me. And then 10 million or 20 million I've got left is going to go on to somebody else. Fine. What should the asset allocation be of the million dollars that you need for yourself? So let's work on that. And we work on an asset allocation for the million dollars. Then we say, now, what asset allocation would you recommend for your children or your grandchildren who aren't going to need the money for 30 years? What do you think we should do there? We come up with a separate asset allocation. Might be 60% equity. And the one for ourselves might be 40% or 30 or maybe even 20 or some number. All right. So then we put the two together. Now, therefore, if a million dollars is for you and it's at this allocation and $10 million is for your children and it's at that allocation, then overall, what should your asset allocation be? And they said, well, they're probably 55 equity, 45 bonds. Good. Done. Finished. Next question. Nice. <laughs> solid. Rock solid answer. Uh, one of the last questions we want to ask you, Rick, is, is about uh, John Bogle, who, who recently passed away, uh, unfortunately. Now, you mentioned the impact that Vanguard, and actually, as a little side note, I've never heard anyone describe the importance of Vanguard in the US pushing forward index funds, and that being a reason that it did not happen the same way in Canada. That's, I mean, I, I guess people have alluded to it that way in the past, but describing it explicitly that way and attributing it to Vanguard, I thought that was, uh, that was fascinating. So Bogle obviously had a big impact on the industry. You've interviewed him. I believe you knew him. I thought it would be great if you could maybe just speak a little bit about him as a person and how he changed the financial services industry. Oh, wow. That's a big order. Well, of course, he was an icon, although he was a very unassuming person, meaning that he didn't want to take any credit. I mean, he took credit. He he loved the spotlight and all that, but 
he was a very simple man, really, personally, in, a, in his personal life. And he, it's almost the statue that they built for him at Vanguard, he, he kind of laughs at it. It's almost like John Bogle said, everybody should be doing this. Why isn't everyone trying to help everyone else? It's not me, John Bogle. Everybody should be helping everybody else. That's why we exist on this earth. So don't give me any credit for what I did. Everybody should be trying to help. And, and that's the way he was. He would go to great lengths to shake people's hands and remember their names and talk with them and answer letters. I have two or three handwritten letters from him on a little card. Uh, every time I did something or sent him something, he would send a handwritten letter back. I mean, he was just a, a unique individual. And he was believable and trustworthy and committed. You knew what he was going to say before he said it. He's done more for individual investors worldwide than anybody in the last 50 years since the first index fund came out. So I can only hold a big lighter. You know, you go to a concert. Well, I'm dating myself. You go to a concert and there's there's the, the act on the stage and it's just absolutely phenomenal. And and all you can do is at the end of the concert, hold up your Bic lighter. Of course, now we, now we hold up our iPhones. And, uh, you know, I'm one of the people in the audience holding up my iPhone, you know, saying that I will, I believe, you know, I, well, what you do. And I'm a disciple. I'm a follower. I will do what I can to help promote what you started. And away we go. I honestly can't say much more about the man. He, he did so much for me personally, he changed my life through changing my career and a great man who will be remembered for a long time. Very well said. And it's interesting, Rick, because as I said earlier, I've been following you for years. So that trickle down has come through to our firm. And, you know, the next generation of advisors and Ben and the others here kind of trickles through the whole system. So it is, it's incredible to see the impact around the world. I mean, speaking around the world, a few weeks ago, we interviewed uh, Robin Powell, who I know you know, and who interviewed you, I believe, for his documentary. In our interview, he made the case that journalists have some responsibility to publish, not simply publish stories about, about stock picking, but actually publish more stories about the truth about how markets work and what the evidence is. Do you agree with that assessment? To a point, a journalist work for a company. The company has to appease their advertising clients, the advertising clients, if they're big, large, actively managed funds or hedge funds or whomever they are, the company has a right to ask its journalists to mention those companies, to at least not say things bad about those companies. They have a right to do that. The journalist is not independent. They're not a freelancer. They work for that company. So if the company wants the journalist to play down what the journalist may personally believe and play up what brings the company that they work for advertising dollars. I think they have a right to do that. It's a great way of looking at it. Uh, and by right, the way, right. if a journalist has a problem with that, then they need to, to leave the company they're working for and find someone, find another company that may not have that restrictive policy or go out on their own and freelance. Now, so if their career is like me, I worked for a brokerage firm for 10 years and I didn't like what I was supposed to be telling my clients, what the company really wanted me to tell my clients. Then I got up and left and started my own company. And I think a journalist, if they're professional and they're going to follow their heart rather than their paycheck, they could they would do that as well. So Rick, you, you've written seven books, right? I think, I think so. Yeah, working, sounds working, right. <laughs> <laughs> working on the eighth, I guess. You built a, a great firm, which you've now left. You've got another venture going. You've changed probably many thousands of investors' lives, probably in the tens of thousands with all of the writing that you've done. So the question that I have for you to finish is with all the things that you've accomplished so far in your life and now looking ahead, how do you define success for yourself going forward? I just want to continue to be part of the conversation. And that was a quote that Jonathan Clement said to me when I did a podcast with him a couple of months ago. Jonathan doesn't need to work anymore. I don't need to work anymore. But I just want to continue to be part of the conversation. I have, I have, it seems like I have more to say now at uh, age 60, almost 61, than I did when I was 40. <laughs> I believe that keeping things simple explaining things so that people can understand them, taking complex ideas and breaking them down into easy bits and letting people comprehend it is important. And there's a quote that I won't take credit for, but I use all the time. 
The truth must be repeated over and over again because lies are constantly being told around it. So I am just going to continue to repeat the truth over and over again, and that's my contribution. Well, Rick, I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you giving us the time to, to come on the podcast. Rick, thanks for being part of our conversation for all you've done to change you know, how we are helping people in our part of the world. Well, thank you for inviting me. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.